So in preparation for the next class, um, which will be class number seven for Thursday, July, Fifteenth. Um, the readings will be about humanism. So, for this class, uh, the previous class, we went from Aristotle's personal virtues. Then we talked about political virtues, the virtue of an educated citizen. We also talked about the virtue a virtuous manager. How does somebody lead an organization? The focus there was everything is connected, personal virtues, social virtues. Plus, if you're running a good organization, you're teaching people how to think about public affairs. You're open to criticism. You criticize yourself. You let your employees know that you are self-correcting. You, you engage in transparency and accountability. So they're actually learning how to be citizens in a democratic society. So you want your companies to be run just like a democracy. So then your employees are habituated into living this way and treating other people this way. Um, ideally, that would be what would go on in the home is that parents would raise children to have high moral standards, but to take pleasure in those standards and then to converse with them about life, about their own behavior, about their emotions, about their reasons, that there would be transparency and accountability. Um, and then when parents do exercise authority, they would have good reasons. And when the children get old enough, they would explain the reasons. So the student, again, the children start governing themselves. That would be the goal. Then you go into an organization and the leader treats uh, the the employees in a way that they can start self-regulating, they can take on leadership positions. Ideally, they would become so good at managing within their subgroups that they would go start their own company and it would be successful. And then if people learn how to relate that way, they develop that kind of a culture, they can also go into the political realm and they can um, become good citizens, good voters, good um, people who can talk to each other about what sort of national legislation should be made, why, why one decision is better than the other, why one leader is better than the other, and it should be based on their policies and their, their character not based on you know, some emotional reaction, um, not based on image, not based. So the, our founding fathers are very concerned about manipulation rather than education and about ending up losing your democracy because a power hungry person has convinced you that they're the person to run the democracy. All right, so we talked about that. Now, this time we're taking that model of management from a context of an institution and we're bringing it into the international arena. So the United Nations has a Declaration of Human Rights, which I will go over, but what they actually measure in order to figure out how to evaluate a country as more just or less just, they have what's called a capabilities model. Given at that time in that country, what sort of resources are possible? What's possible for, for promoting flourishing in that country? 
And flourishing is going to be very closely connected to a middle class. So what is the ruling class doing to promote development into the middle class so that everyone can flourish? Um, so uh, the, the United States, uh, American citizens are way less aware of the United Nations and what it does than people in almost every other country in the world. Um, because every country in the world has a vote in the General Assembly. So for a lot of countries, this is their one big international um, publicity, transparency, participation in international government. So they care a lot about who their representative is and what's going on in the UN. And is that helping their country or not? So I do think um, students in America really need to know what's going on with the UN. And the UN is humanist. And people in the UN, some of them are religiously based, some of them are not. They come from every possible religion, of course. Um, so here's the Declaration of Human Rights. Um, and I would like you to read it over. Then you may want to um, comment on it in class. The first 21 articles are very Western. The, everyone's free and equal. They're entitled to all these rights, regardless of race, sex, language, religion, whatever. Uh, a right to life, liberty, and security. You can't be a slave. You can't be subject to torture. You have an equal um, recognition before the law. Everybody's equal under the law. Uh, you can't be discriminated against. Um, okay, those are all related to the laws. A right to be presumed innocent until proven guilty. Um, all right, a right to freedom of movement, uh, a right to leave their country, a right to uh, seek and enjoy asylum from persecution in other countries. So there are people who come to the US seeking asylum and that's different from the people who just wanna immigrate. Um, a right to a nationality, um, right to marry, uh, the partners have to have full consent. All right, so up until 21, a right to peaceful assembly. Then in 21, um, equal access to public service. Um, all right, I think it may be 22, the right to social security. Um, cooperation accordance, okay. Everyone has the right to work. So a government has to provide people with jobs and a free choice. So in the US, people do not have a right to work. They have to find their own jobs and the free market has to function, right? And people have to adjust and figure out how to become employable. Um, but th this article, the Articles 23 to 28 are more socialist. So the UN tried to unify the kind of rights in the West, especially America's minimal government intervention with what was going on in Russia and China. So it's a synthesis. It's not rabid socialism, rabid capitalism. It tries to integrate them. Um, a right to equal pay for equal work a right, um, a right to um, a decent pay, um, a right to form trade unions, a right to rest and leisure, right? You can't make people work too much. Uh, the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself, um, a right to provisions in old age, a right to um, children, 
um, special care for women. So all of that stuff is taxed. Now in the US, we have a lot of that stuff and we don't call ourselves a socialist country. So those words, capitalism, socialism, free market, you know, all that stuff, they don't really apply to people. There's the only country that really has, still has socialism would be North Korea. Every other country is some kind of regulated capitalism, free market. Now in China, of course, it's extremely regulated and it's a small part of the market, but it's there. They allow the, they allow the entrepreneurs in. So it, it exists. It's just China has a much more authoritarian model than the US. Europe has model. Every country is play, you know, being creative, you know, figuring out what works best for them. Right to education, um, a right to the development of your personality, okay? Uh, a right to choose the kind of education to give their children, a right to participate in a cultural life, a right to protect the interests. <clears throat> uh, international order. So everyone also has duties to the community. Um, okay, so that's, that is universally agreed upon. Um, 170 countries or so have signed on to it. This is the capabilities list, which is simpler and it's more Aristotelian. So when the UN is evaluating a society, they, they look at what are the resources, how much wealth does society have, how many people do they have, what is the standard of living at the beginning of the year? What programs have been going on to um, encourage economic development and distribution of wealth in a way that provides for the needs? You know, what are the what is the public need in this country in particular? Does the government meet the need? Does it focus on the most pressing needs? Um, does it always use its authority for the benefit of the ruled? And since you know you can't satisfy everyone, for the benefit of the most people whose needs are most pressing at that in that one year, um, being able to live, um, okay, being able to be healthy, being able to move. Being able to, to have your own body, not allow somebody to assault you. Um, being able to use your senses, your imagination, your reasoning in a truly human way so that you don't feel threatened. You have a free mind. You can uh, think for yourself, think on your own, and you can be able to express your mind, being able to use your mind, um, being able to have attachments to things and people. Um, again, and this is, you know, all very anti-authoritarian, right? And also something everybody needs. And so governments try to facilitate a climate where people are encouraged, they are able and encouraged to develop themselves as human beings they should have the opportunity to form their own conception of the good. And that would be every major religion is some conception of the good, um, concern for other people, um, being able to live with concern for the rest of the ecosphere, biosphere, being able having some leisure time, uh, being able to participate in political life and in economic life, being able to have property. So, so that's that. Then um, I have you reading this article about um, good leaders, good global leaders. Um, so I start out with the capabilities model and then I say, here's a vision of a person of practical wisdom. Now, this should 
you know, it's very similar to the paper about management or, but it just talks about um, running a country, right? And how you connect your country to other countries. Um, and it's supposed to be a generic point of view. It's not criticizing monarchy per se, it's criticizing the abuse of power. Um, every just ruler should move his society in the direction of polity. So you can inherit a monarchy, but then you can have, you can centralize the power more or you can decentralize the power. Um, England has a constitutional monarchy and a parliament. So, so the queen is pretty much just a figurehead. And that happened, you know, it took a long time and various rebellions. Um, so Aristotle would advocate for the rule of law as much as possible because it's more stable. Um, and also a combination of elected officials and appointed officials, which I've said before. Um, okay, statecraft is the word or the translation of the word that is practical wisdom in relationship to political uh, power. Um, he, he worries about demagogues. That was also in the previous article we read. So I think this is pretty self-explanatory. He's not ideological. <coughs> he doesn't say, you know, communism is great, communism is horrible. He doesn't just take a word. So ideology means that your logos, your arguments are based on an idea. So you just take this one idea and you sort of ramrod it through. Um, when you say your idea is rule for the sake of the rules, you're saying, okay, that's, that's the background and everything you do is a judgment call. It's not, you don't have this one rule and you can just, in every situation, you just refer it back to the same rule. No. It isn't the way we operate anyway, but it isn't even the way he pretends to operate. Um, okay, let's see. The difference between the virtue of a citizen and the virtue of a human being. They're, they're a different aspect of life, but it's the same virtues, but they're exercised in a different context. So how can it be, <coughs> be applied today? Um, let's see, women, um, okay, so there's some countries, because of their situation, they might need a more authoritarian leader, but you can still evaluate that leader according to whether they're corrupting their power or not. Um, so I talk about that a little bit. Um, The United Nations tries to bring everyone closer to this model of the rule of law and a middle class. Um, okay, so theory of the virtues. Um, and so I go through all the virtues. You have to take pleasure in the virtues. That's your character. Um, temperance, I apply that to international political issues. Um, the importance in the household of children growing up living moderately, because otherwise international um, relations between nations is affected by this. If people want more than their share, you're going to declare war for resources. They're going to be expansionist. And that's a serious problem. Also fear. If people are overly afraid of other countries, then they militarize. And then the other countries become afraid of them and they militarize, right? So then you have to balance out statecraft, diplomacy. How can you work with countries 
and be a trustworthy player, right? So the reason for an intelligence um, bureaucracy, the FBI and the CIA, et cetera, is to make sure that when you're dealing with another country, when you're talking to their diplomats, their president, that they're telling the truth, <laughs> right? And so that's why you have your spies. Is this really true? And then you can start making deals. You can start writing treaties. You can start um, interacting in ways that prevent war and that build trust. So courage is really important for international relationships. Every country needs a military sector of society for national security, but that can be overly valued and used too much, or it can be ignored too much. And history, you know, in general, people tend to use military solutions too much, and they lead to way more destruction than they should, and to feelings of revenge, the desire for revenge. So uh, war, I don't think war ever solves problems. It might be the only way to deal with a certain situation. I'm willing to grant that, but don't ever think it solves a problem, no matter who wins or loses. Um, people always disagree on how to apply these definitions and these standards, uh, the importance of giving money away. Um, so during the COVID, um, the fact that we're we're giving vaccines to developing countries. This is very good for developing friendship bonds. Um, and we aren't giving a lot away compared to how much need there is. But anyway, we are doing that. Um, we're being generous. Um, let's see. So what else can I say about Oh yeah, okay. I don't think Aristotle is idealistic. Why not? Um, first of all, it's vague, right? So the criticisms, who gets to decide, right? It's vague. This is practical wisdom. Who gets to decide what the options are? Is there any uh, opportunity for criticism of whoever has the power to sort of divine define the situation? Well, of course, right? Um, of course, it can be corrupted. Of course, it's vague. But once you get that, you get it focused to, the, to that certain extent that this is really a question of courage, or this is really a question of anger and revenge, or this is really a question of honor, whatever then you can figure out, is there too much, too little, what's appropriate? And then you can also self-correct. You can listen to other people's opinions. You can come up with the best solution at that time that you can think of giving, given the circumstances. Um, all right, and then another one is it's too idealistic. Well, what are the alternatives? Um, I think it's very idealistic to think you can come up with any sort of moral absolutes because those absolutes will be applied by people. It's just and they, according to their judgment, but they will be able to hide behind the moral absolute. And so, so I think it doesn't train your mind as well because it it trains you to try to keep putting situations in these boxes of absolutes, when as a matter of fact, situations are constantly changing. So if you have a model that says, you have to constantly keep up with this because it's changing, but you want to maximize flourishing, that would be better than to just have, I've decided that applying this rule will create flourishing and I'm gonna apply it even when situations change, even if it doesn't work this time, it'll work next time. So I think that is too idealistic, but I also think um, thinking that you can tell people to be greedy 
and you can saturate them with advertising and you can get people to spend money on things they don't need, that somehow that's going to make a country prosperous and flourishing because the economic, the gross domestic product, right, will be growing, right? I think to think that you can constantly feed desires and end up with a decent society is hopelessly idealistic. People say it's realistic, but it is not. The realism is that that will lead to animosity, to a gap between the rich and the poor, to the elimination of a middle class, to resentment on the part of the poor, and instability. So the reality is if you feed greed, you're going to get instability. Um, if you feed power as the ultimate value, you're going to get instability. If you feed practical wisdom and virtue as the goal, the ideal that people strive for, you will have plenty of problems, but you will do better overall. So that's realism. That's not idealism. And then you can say, well, people make mistakes. Not everybody, that's impossible to achieve. Well, it's not intended to be a model where somebody could actually every day in every way get it right. It's a model for what we aspire to. It's a model for kind, the kind of social fabric we have. It's a model for what sorts of discussions and situations we expect to be triggers for dialogue. So we expect dialogue. We expect transparency, accountability. We expect self-correction. We expect reflection. Um, and if you expect it, and over time, you're going to be able to honor, recognize who's actually better at it, honor them, give them more authority, um, listen to them, correct them if they made a mistake. So I think it's the most realistic um, because it, that's the way we actually live. <laughs> I mean, people talk like this. They might say, um, so Caitlin talked about her coach and she was looking at that management model and saying, oh my gosh, you know, this has come up. All of these things have come up in the coach and the relationship between the coach and the team and all the sorts of decisions the coach makes. Well, yes, not only that, but um, in at Lyon, sometimes the students really have opinions about their coaches. And sometimes a coach leaves and the students uh, had a lot of opinions. So I remember one time, this a lot of students wrote, like five students wrote about, of, about coaching and they were football players. And they had lots of opinions about what's appropriate. And lo and behold, some coach, one or two coaches left. Um, but that's because they were talking, they were engaged in exactly this kind of dialogue. So um, I think it is the way people are. People might have said, well, I trusted that coach. And then they went and did that. Or the coach was doing fine until they did that. Or the coach actually started out sort of playing favorites, but then they figured that that was really not creating a good climate and they changed. And now we have a better climate. Or the coach started out wanting to treat everyone equally, but just gravitating toward these favorites and the climate got more and more poisoned uh, until it got bad enough that the coach realized what was going on and then the coach self-corrected. I mean, that is the way we think, I think. Um, we can disagree on what the mean is. We can disagree on how much a coach um, can, you know, should favor at all or not at all for a little bit or in this situation. But that's, that's exactly the way people talk. Um, I didn't do that a lot because I was more of a loner. Um, but 
when I'm running around the lake or walking in public, people are always talking like that. They're always talking about their relationships or maybe what they're going to spend money on, temperance. They're always using these virtues and applying it to some situation. I'm kind of surprised because my parents didn't talk like that. They were always talking about political life and the civil rights movement, the ecumenical movement, the Vietnam War, the, the environmental problems. That's what my parents talked about. They did not talk about people at all. Um, but when I left home, I realized, oh, people talk about this stuff, right? And I talked to myself about it. So it's ultimately an inner dialogue of the soul with itself. But um, I do think this is the way our minds operate. Um, in spite of all the disagreements, um, I, I envisioned a society that would be based on the virtues of temperance and uh, liberality, generosity, and um, courage, right? Those three basic virtues, what would it be like? It's not in theory unattainable. And it's also something where it's concrete. The description is concrete enough that you can use it as you move forward. When you're making a decision, oh, this is related to courage or this is related. You can relate it right back to the theory. That's what I like about it. Um, what happens when the capabilities, the higher order capabilities are developed, but without temperance, courage, or liberality? And that's a big problem. So the United States has a lot of college educated people, perhaps, a lot of other higher order institutions, but the people are, their eating habits are so terrible that they're making themselves sick, right? And so they're crippled at these lower order sort of behaviors and it's crippling the higher order sort of activity. The fear of death is crippling us and leading to a lot of um, debt and not enough money for education. The, um, anyway, so I, I talk about that. And again, that can apply to any country. So the conclusion here is about liberal arts education for the 21st century. So, um, so that's my main thing is that you can bring in Aristotle's version of spiritual humanism. You can attach it to the United Nations. You can apply it to any country and to rulers in the countries and you'll come out with some insights. Um, all right, so the next issue that I'm going to talk about is women women and capabilities, or you could say women's rights, right? Um, I just tend to use the word capabilities more because it's more concrete. It makes more sense to me. So I start out the paper by listing the capabilities. And then um, I talk about the power of ideas. So practical reason, number six, it appears to be very esoteric. Like the first ones are like food and your body, you can't get raped and basic stuff, right? That I can understand. What is this number six? <laughs> Practical reason, the ability to form a conception of life. My argument is that this is the most important one because the society that you were born into the one that you have, you live in now that you come to college was based on people before you having certain ideas of the good and they structured the society around those ideas. And um, two of those ideas in the US were racism, that African-Americans are somehow not capable of higher order culture Therefore, that justifies their place in society, and also that women are not capable of theoretical thinking. So they're not capable 
of theoretical wisdom or practical wisdom, because if you're going to have practical wisdom, you have to see the theoretical, the patterns behind it, as I've indicated in the past. You have to understand why based on the human condition. And women aren't capable of that. And that's why they don't get higher education. They don't get positions, any of the higher positions. And lo and behold, they end up at home being wives and mothers and take care of the household because that's their natural place. All right. Um, so what I, my paper is about Mary Wollstonecraft. She says that every time kids are born by a, a race or gender, sex, sexual orientation. Little kids know. <laughs> little Mary Wollstonecraft, that little girl knew that these boys aren't smarter than her. And yet she runs into a situation where they get to go to school and she doesn't. Um, same with race or they're not more moral, right? I mean, a little kid is not stupid. And, and you have to condition people into those vices, racism, sexism, classism. Kids don't care about money. They would rather have a cheap thing to wear that they can get dirty and that some sort of fancy Gucci whatever. So it's sad to see children getting habituated to do something that is not natural for them. Um, but anyway, so what does she say? Denying her claim is that when you deny women's equal intellectual ability, it leads to all other kinds of discrimination. So if she's not capable of theoretical thinking, she doesn't have the strength, the reasoning to control her emotions. And you have to control your emotions to avoid doing things that are going to make you damned in hell, <laughs> right? So on a religious basis, you have to be virtuous to be saved and you have to have reason to be virtuous. So why would you deny? So any sort of God that would deny women reason, and yet if you mess up, you go to hell. It's like, ha, you know, this God, <laughs> I'm going to send all those women to hell. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's ridiculous. So she says that. I mean, no God is going to do that. So if women are accountable for their behavior, they must have the uh, strong strength of reason. They have to have reason in order to control that behavior. Uh, what is reason? The power of generalizing, right? So that's what I've said. You see a particular situation, you can generalize it, right? That's what we've been doing. Um, and in our tradition, some people, Secular humans think it's the product of evolution. Some people think it's a gift from God. That's okay. All that matters, use it. <laughs> use it. That's what the philosopher says. I don't care how you think we got it. We have it. I try to get you to be aware that you have it and you should use it. Um, discrimination. So they discriminate against women in education because of their definition. Well, then you deny women moral responsibility. Then you deny them. Um, so that's unjust. So there's, you argue that, and Wollstonecraft understands childhood habits, right? Kids have to learn this from when they're young. Educated women are better partners, spouses, because the relationship is based on friendship first, not just sexual attraction. Uh, women's modesty is based on her rationality, not on her uh, blind obedience to men's rules. Um, educated women would expect their marriages to evolve into friendships. An educated mother would be a better mother because she wouldn't allow her children to be impulsive. She would model rational behavior. Educated women um, would be better participants in political life because they wouldn't just worry about their husband's power and wealth because their identity's caught up in being the wife of so-and-so. So they would be ambitious for him, even if that's not appropriate. Um, she would be able to think about politics and then she would, you know, she would deserve the right to vote. 
but because she deserves the right to vote, she has reason. It's just that when it isn't educated, then she's an uneducated voter. So she needs to be educated. She would be less likely to get duped by religious charlatans who manipulate her. Um, and then I say, why should we read Wilsoncraft? Well, because, you know, we have these similar patterns. And especially when I teach in Bangladesh to students from Southeast Asia, yeah, they can spot it right away. So Wollstonecraft explains the power of the external environment, but also the limits of that power. You can never deny the natural equality of women and, and non-whites because it just appears every time a child is born. Um, then Nussbaum, Martha Nussbaum, talks about um, the same issues, development, and um, she talks about the enforced modesty all over the world um, and the importance of developing women and religious laws often lead to the denial of women's rights, but um, they don't have to be, you don't have to throw out religion. There's no reason based, uh, there's no, if you just look at what a religion is and then it holds people accountable and they have to have reason to be accountable, you don't have to throw out religion. It's the way men have used religion to gain a lot of power over women. That's the problem is the corruption of religion. Um, and the last thing I want to point out, which will be the third part of the class, is John Stuart Mill's book, which I'm just giving you the outline, arguing for the equality of women. Now, in his day, of course, women <laughs> were not treated equally. And so he has to use the tools of science, of empirical observation, to draw an inference about envisioning a different future. So he's trying to argue based on your own data that everything we're doing is wrong. And that's hard, right? Because you have to have some evidence that if we treat them equally, it'll be better. And, and science is evidence-based. You wait till the event has already occurred or it is occurring. And he's arguing based on that method for a radical shift, like women's equality is more radical than any other shift. It's over half of the people in the world, right? Um, why is it difficult to prove? So I want you to go through all these arguments. The reason why this is a great book and the reason why this guy had a really good mind in the Greek sense of mind is that Every, you know, every point, and I, what is this, four, six pages. Um, so I'm not going to sit here and recite all that. You go through it, and I want you to notice that this stuff makes sense. This is still true. And then I want you to pick out two or three of your favorite arguments. Why is it difficult to prove this? Well, because most people go on feelings and feelings are contradict what's reasonable and the influence of social habituation. And most people don't want to re-examine their, their thoughts or their lives. And actually, everything else he says, he's living in the 1800s, is moving toward greater equality and freedom. So why wouldn't you move women in that direction? Like, it should be the, the conservatives that should have to defend their position. Why is it the progressives have to defend it? Well, because they don't have the power. <laughs> Conservatives have the power and the money. It's also hard to prove a negative. Everything we're doing is wrong. The thing is romanticized. It's perceived as natural. Religion is used to justify it, even though that's a terrible abuse of religion. And we don't have knowledge. We don't have the social science research, what he, which is what he was looking forward to that. It's important for someone to speak out because male domination was never initiated in a scientific way. Here we'll have female domi domination, here we'll have male domination, here we'll have equality. We'll let these societies 
run and we'll see which one works, right? That's how you do science. You have your um, control experiment and whatever. And he says, we've never, we've never done that. It's always been might makes right, right? I have the power and I'm not going to let go of it. What about the argument that women accept it? And then he responds to that, where they're afraid to complain, right? Um, and he, all the causes make it very unlikely that even some women would speak out. The fact that they do speak out means that there's, there's something wrong here. Um, what does history teach us? And I want you to think that through the importance of free and open discussion. We're back to liberal arts education once again. I keep getting back to that. Um, do you agree with that? Um, very few men know the characters even of their wives and daughters. Is that true, right? Do you agree with that? Policies toward women are inherently contradictory. If women really are by nature wives and mothers, give them every opportunity in the book and they won't take it, right? If they really are by nature, why do you keep forcing this? So if you keep forcing this and not allowing them, the suspicion is that they actually could do it so that you're wrong. Um, yeah. <laughs> so marriage, uh, it should be pleasant and it's not, it's miserable. So that, he points that out, that's horrible. If you're going to force women to marry and not let them work, you need to structure some way of preventing that relationship from being one of absolute power and abuse. And they did it, right? It was a relationship of absolute power and abuse. Women had no way out. Um, family life should be based on equality, not absolute power. Um, the laws, how do you change the laws? And how do you incorporate philosophy and religion into this? Um, teaching self-sacrifice, but then it's women who have to do all the sacrificing. That's, that's no good. And you can ignore the last page because that was related to the way I used to teach this class. Um, but I don't want to keep you any longer for a lot of reasons. Um, it's been just about an hour and that's plenty. But please come prepared. Please show me that you did spend substantial time on this. Please refer to, I would say, three places, quotes or paraphrase in each of these um, articles in the outline. The first article, the second article, and the outline. Um, this is normally what I assign in two days, so I know it's condensed. It's not the sweetened condensed version. It's the sort of bitter condensed version because I know it's a lot of work, uh, but you signed up for it knowing what it was. So take care, and I will see you tomorrow.